We'll see if this works. I've not had much success recording these screencasts so far, but um, I'm ever the optimist. Um, right. What I'm... Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is based on um, a presentation I gave, um, a research presentation I gave, in fact, which eventually um, turned into the article which, um, which you read uh, last week, the Gothic Materialism article. Um, so I'm mindful of some of the comments in the module evaluations that you made um, last week regarding um, the... Uh, pace of lectures and things like that. Um, there is, th th there's a certain amount of sort of um, material in here which is um, conceptually complicated. I'll try to um, not just kind of race through all of that. Um, and, um, but also, I, sorry, just, just as a sort of general illustration of a point that was also came from the module evaluations about the noise of the door banging um, in, in the recordings for this. It would be really helpful if you could arrive um, before the start of the lecture rather than during it. Um, anyway, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll try uh, not to kind of race through those things, but in any case, um, because this was uh, eventually kind of for, found fruition in the form of a published article, if you do want to sort of follow up any of those things, they're, they're more fully developed there. Anyway, uh, enough of a preamble. Um, so, the range of topics that um, I, I'm sort of talking about here and that I'm interested in here um, is pretty broad um, and what I'm interested in in many respects with, um, with Conan Doyle and um, both the, the ghost stories, mummy fiction and also the Hand of the Baskervilles, um, the, the, the stuff that he's writing really after he's um, lost patience with, with Sherlock Holmes shall we say, um, is a way in which lots of different ideas all kind of get mixed up together. Um, and I made a comment in seminars last week to a few students that, in a sense, that's what Gothic is for. Gothic um, is a fantastic medium for exploring contradictions because it allows you to put things together which don't go together. It allows you to kind of fantasise resolutions for things which are impossible. Um, and to, to explore these sorts of contradictions and difficulties. So um, in the range of these stories that I'm interested in, there's, there's, there's all sorts of different things that come in. Egyptian mummies, uh, how do the Baskervilles... The Society for Psychical Research, which is a real thing, as well as cropping up in uh, the brown hand um, as, as something which one of the characters is involved in. Um, a whole kind of sub-genre in the late 19th century on ghostly hands. Um, comparative anatomy, so science, degeneration theory. Tourism in Egypt at the time, Thomas Cook's, um, and how that was implicated with the development of British imperialism in the period. Have you all come from somewhere? <laughs> David, right. I should be having words with David, Rudra. <laughs> um, okay, and um, also, uh, so, so um, the, the kind of relationship between tourism and literature and also imperial expansion in the period, and Thomas Cooks was interestingly involved with all of those things. So there's a wide range of different things. I'm not obviously going to do a comprehensive discussion of them, but what I'm interested in is the way that Conan Doyle kind of takes lots of these different strands and weaves them together in, in kind of fascinating and, and quite bizarre ways sometimes. Um, so in terms of key points I want to talk about, I'm interested in developments in late Victorian Gothic genre. Um, I'm interested in what Doyle starts writing about or what he's interested in writing about um, in the 1890s between the death of Sherlock Holmes and when he brings him back in the hands of the Baskervilles. And I'm also interested in what I'm, the, the porosity, that is to say the, the way in which these things to do with cultural formations around spirit, around ideas about science and around ideas about empire, three things which ought to seem to be quite discrete unrelated activities, kind of merge and blend with each other in uh, Conan Doyle's writing of this period. So the, the claims that I'm sort of making in this piece of research and, and, and this article that I put forward is that, um, that Conan Doyle's writing in the 1890s represents a reasonably innovative development in what I call in materialist Gothic, or Gothic materialism actually, is what I ended up calling it. Um, part of my argument is that 
the, the reason that this particular thing comes about is because Conan Doyle is trying to shape or manipulate shape or manipulate one sort of dominant ideology in the late 19th century, which is to do with science and the domination of public discourse by science. Um, and he's trying to, to shape that and make arguments about that by means of another one, which is to do with imperialism and empire. So he's trying to shape ideas about science by drawing upon um, existing attitudes towards empire. And in particular, ideas about the primitive and the way that the primitive is an idea or an association that can be kind of foisted onto somebody else. Um, so I'm interested in the way that Doyle's fiction draws upon a complicity that's already in place around ideas about the primitive um, and the way in which ideas about the primitive relates to ideas about the thing. Okay, the, the thing is a, is a, a term that's been used um, quite a lot in, in recent critical theory. And in fact, there is a branch of critical theory called thing theory, which I'll, I'll say a little bit about later on. Okay, so that's the... The summary, if you came in late, you missed it. Um, outline. So I'm going to talk about materialist Gothic in, in some general terms, as, uh, in terms of genre. Um, talking about this idea of there being a scientific ideological settlement of the late 19th century, which is a bit of a mouthful, but basically means that in the late 19th century, science became the, sort of, sort of the most powerful uh, and, generally speaking, hegemonic way of talking about the world and describing the world. So we're talking about... Doyle writing in relation to a worldview that has now become dominated by rationalist, empirical ways of understanding the world, as opposed to you know, pr uh, primarily uh, religious um, ways of looking at the world. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about Conan Doyle and his relationship to spiritualism and the Society for Psychical Research, SPR. Um, a bit about imperialism and anthropology, the, the other, and then, then return to this idea of Gothic materialism. Um, so I'll see how I do to get through all of that. Um, so, materialist gothic. Um, in a quite influential study of, um, uh, sort of gothic kinds of genres, the narrative theorist Svetan Todorov um, published a book in 1973 called The Fantastic. And in The Fantastic, he sought to differentiate the sort of gothic type fiction, uh, or, or, or the fantastic, into three different categories. Um, the first of these is the uncanny, um, and to represent the uncanny, um, Scooby-Doo. So, the, the point about the uncanny is, it's a situation which seems to have some sort of fantastical uh, possibilities. You know, there's, there's a ghost in the, in the old closed-down theme park, you know, that kind of thing. But it always turns out to have a kind of perfectly straightforward explanation. So, for Todorov, the, the uncanny um, is an apparent fantastical situation that, in the end, has a perfectly ordinary explanation. He differentiates this from the marvellous, where, if you like, the, the rules of, of, of everyday life, the rules of the world, get rewritten because something which previously seemed to be impossible, you know, the return of the dead, um, turns out to be possible. So in the marvellous, the supernatural explanation turns out to be the right one. So in this case, you know, mummy fiction, you know, the, the return of a 5,000-year-old mummy from the dead. Um, the pure fantastic, Todorov says, is, a, is quite a rare thing. It's not often that you get a story that doesn't decide itself one way or the other. Um, one of the few um, obvious examples that we might point to is Henry James's novel, A Turn of the Screw, where it's really not possible to say on the basis of internal evidence in the text whether or not there really were ghosts or whether they were some sort of psychological projections of the governess if you've read The Turn of the Screw. Um, so that would be an example of the pure fantastic, uh, as opposed to the the fantastic uncanny or the fantastic marvellous. Now, in terms of the stories that we're interested in here, um, the uncanny, I guess, will be represented by the Ring of Thoth. You know, it's a story in which what appears to be something that's impossible, you know, that a 5,000-year-old uh, man, turns out to be purely a, a, a kind of bit of chemistry. Um, there's nothing supernatural or mysterious about it. Um, the marvellous would be Lot number 249, where, as far as the story uh, goes, uh, a, a dead body has been reanimated and sort of sent on various sort of, uh, violent, murderous sorts of missions around um, Oxford. And I guess I would suggest that the brown hand we might look at as an example of the fantastic, 
not in the same way as the turn of the screw, but in the sense that, on the one hand, the, the belief in the, um, the, the sort of sacred integrity of the body um, as a sort of necessary condition for passing on to the next life turns out to be something which can be faked or, or, or the, the ghost can be duped into it. So that turns out not to be really the case. But at the same time, the story is also validating the idea of ghosts in the first place. So it seems to be kind of doing two different things. So it's a little bit undecided, I guess. But I think also the, the, the idea of the fantastic is, and, and this distinction between the uncanny and the marvellous, between rewriting the rules of the world or, or just reaffirming them, is, is an interesting way of thinking about the Hand of the Baskervilles as well. In fact, that relationship between the supernatural and the material is, is a theme that runs throughout the novel. Um, we have this description um, talking about a spectral hound which leaves material footmarks. That, uh, that contradiction there, you know, what is the Hand of the Baskervilles that, that's, that's at the centre of this mystery? Um, that feels, so a spectral hound which leaves... It, material footmarks and fills the air with its howling is surely not to be thought of. So that, that conjunction of the spectral and the material is an impossible configuration. Um, if I have qual one quality upon earth, it is common sense, and nothing will persuade me to believe in such a thing. So Sherlock Holmes sets his face squarely against this. You can't have this conjunction of the two things, the material and the spiritual. And that, in a sense, marks him out as being rather different from a figure like Hardacre in The Brown Hand who quite clearly is, is willing to tolerate those, uh, those two things in combination. Um, yeah, the picture of Sherlock Holmes and Watson poking his head out of the, the primitive habitations on Dartmoor, which will become significant. Um, Holmes is insistent upon the idea that, that crimes are committed by men of flesh and blood. So it's, it's materiality that, that lies behind it. Um, and there are constant references to sort of checking materiality um, in uh, the, um, the other sort of return of Sherlock Holmes story, not the, the Hand of the Baskervilles, but um, the, the mystery of the empty house, um, or the adventure of the empty house, rather. Um, Watson grabs him by the arm and says, well, you're not a spirit anyhow, said I. Um, and Holmes, a man of iron, is shaken to the soul. So that sort of recurrence between emphasis upon bodily materiality, real empirical things which can be grabbed and hold and measured, um, and on the other hand ideas about spirit and soul, is a, is a kind of recurrent motif that runs through the novel, um, as well as those short stories. So some of the characteristics of this sort of shift from, I suppose, the fantastic as this undecidable thing to something that it's like a materialist gothic, you know, a gothic that's concerned with actually sort of empirically demonstrating the supernatural. Um, in Conan Doyle's writing is this repeated emphasis upon there being empirical evidence for, you know, the supernatural, the preternatural, whatever you want to call it. The preeminence of scientists within these stories as well is also very notable. Um, in um, uh, The Ring of Thoth we have Van Sittart Smith, who's a, an eminent scientist, we got Abercrombie Smith um, in lot number 249, Hardacre in The Brown Hand, um, Mortimer, um, Dr. Mortimer, Alphonse Bertillon, and Sherlock Holmes, all of whom have some sort of claims to scientific knowledge um, in The Hand of the Baskervilles. Bertillon, you may not have picked up on these. He's a sort of a reference early on in the first chapter that uh, Mortimer's comparing Holmes to, Bertillon being a real, a real Parisian um, detective. There's also a strong thematic focus on scepticism and evidence and questions about whether or not these things can be verified. Now, in, in, in most Gothic fiction, if you think about if you've read any early eight, sort of Gothic fiction from the 18th century, there isn't really that sort of preoccupation with whether or not this can be scientifically verified. It doesn't really arise, but it does in these stories. And part of that interest in empirical evidence is a particular attention that's paid to things it's remarkable how many of Conan Doyle's stories, either the Sherlock Holmes ones um, or uh, these sort of gothic stories from the 1890s, have at their centre some sort of focus on an, on an object. Um, I mean, uh, we, we looked at the selection of these ghost stories, but there's the leather funnel, the Jew's breastplate, there's a whole number of these things which are focused around sort of magical objects or objects which have some sort of uncanny features. And there is also a foregrounding of otherness. Um, and a stigma of the primitive that's attached to that. 
So you think about that in terms of the, the brown hand is probably the most obvious example where belief in ghosts is validated, but belief in the need for the sanctity of the body uh, after death is treated as some sort of primitive superstition. Okay, so all of which um, brings us to this question about the importance of science and about a scientific worldview uh, in the late 19th century. And what Roger Luckhurst, um, in his book, The Invention of Telepathy, uh, refers to as the ideological settlement. He, he, he dates this to around 1870 and says basically by 1870, the scientific establishment um, had become so um, firmly ensconced and entrenched that the debates, religious controversies, post-Darwin, um, and all that, that kind of thing, had really sort of shifted their balance so that um, the scientific establishment, people like uh, Thomas Henry Huxley in particular, really did dominate public debate. Um, Huxley was a, you know, known as um, Darwin's bulldog, was a, a famously pugnacious character um, who took on Matthew Arnold, uh, for example, arguing that there wasn't really any, any sort of place for a classical literary education anymore, that people should go to university to study science. You know, a lot of, sort of again, sort of debates which are probably reasonably familiar to, to ourselves in this, this day and age. But it's really sort of from the 1870s onwards that this ideological settlement was firmly established. And some examples of this that, uh, that Luckhurst points to are uh, the publication of Huxley's Lay Sermons, his use of sermons in that uh, uh, title, a deliberate kind of uh, a kind of ironic play and affront to the idea of sort of religious um, prognostications and so forth. These lay sermons are really about the public benefit of science. Um, Lubbock's Origin of Civilization, The Descent of Man by Darwin and Tyler's Primitive Culture, all published um, in the, the first years of the 1870s. Just to give you a sort of flavor of, of the kind of the nature of these debates, um, Huxley here. Um, demanding the gradual banishment from all regions of human thought of what we call spirit. So it's, it's a very aggressive, um, anti-spiritual, um, anti-religious, anti-superstitious kind of uh, discourse that um, is this ideological settlement. And you, you note, hopefully, that one of the things that's sort of characteristic about this, and one of the things that I suppose that Conan Doyle, I think, reacted against, was the sense in which these are scientists making claims that go beyond mere scientific facts. These are scientists making claims which, to some extent, amount to value judgments about culture. Um, Edward Burnett Tyler, in a similar vein, described anthropology um, as a reformer's science whose aim is to expose the remains of crude old culture which have passed into harmful superstition and to mark these out for destruction for the good of mankind. And he describes spiritualism um, as a direct revival from the regions of savage philosophy and pe peasant folklore. It's a very, very strong marking of spiritualism as something which is primitive, um, which is, uh, well, yes, yeah, savage um, and belonging to the, the kind of uh, belief systems of the uneducated. And it's therefore a kind of a, a duty of scientists and anthropologists to, uh, to dispense with that and to, to in, indeed pursue it aggressively to destruction. <clears throat> There's a sort of counter-reaction to this. Um, in the um, 1880s in particular, and into the 1890s, and it, it's from this counter-reaction that you get uh, the development of the Society for Psychical Research, which attempts to reevaluate claims about spirituality and, and, um, and unexplained phenomena but to try to do so on the basis of empiricism, or, or, or you know, within the framework of a scientific discourse. Um, so, in this book by um, Gurney, Myers, and Podmore, um, Phantasms of the Living in 1886, we have, um, this is from Frederick Myers' introduction, he says that naturalists attribute the concept of spirit to the childishness of savage man. Yet it appears to me that as we trace the process of evolution from savage to civilized man, we come to a point at which the inadequacy of this explanation is strongly focused on our, ex on our attention. In other words, that that narrative of moving from savage to barbarian to civilized, the sort of dominant narrative of, of 19th century anthropology, they say that this is actually missing something out. 
that there is actually a counter development within this, which is that there are sort of psychological capacities that exist um, in earlier phases of human evolution, if you want to put it in that sort of teleological framework, of sort of moving towards an, an end point of improvement, and, and actually say that modern society has lost something. So that idea about um, Holmes, uh, Sherlock Holmes' savage genius, for example, is the idea that Sherlock Holmes has access to some sort of primitive, in inverted commas, faculties, which have otherwise been lost in, um, in modern culture. Um, and Myers and Gurney and Podmore go on to suggest that the connection of anthropology with psychical research will be evident to any reader who has acquainted himself with recent expositions of primitive man. Um, in other words, the idea that so-called primitive man, and then in spiritualist circles, they point to the spirit mediums largely being women, working class men, or people of more primitive societies. That that demonstrates that these less highly evolved groups of people within that sort of anthropological discourse have greater access to psychical abilities. So there's a, there's a sort of counter-narrative, and, and Conan Doyle very much buys into this. This idea that, um, that the, the dominant scientific establishment is sort of willfully and aggressively blind to the possibility that there may be more to um, spiritualism and so forth than, uh, than uh, is at first glance, and particularly on the basis of these empirical observations. And Doyle, being this kind of person, got, um, got very involved in uh, the Society of Psychical Research for a while. Um, he was particularly interested in the idea that their investigations into telepathy might point to something beyond just the communication of one living mind with another. Um, for Doyle, um, as soon as you could demonstrate the possibility of telepathic communication, then that already sort of destroyed the idea that, that communication or anything else to do with the mind has to have a purely physical basis. If you can have telepathy for Doyle, then you can have you know, life after death and all the rest of it proceeds from that. So as he says, if mind could act upon mind at a distance, then there were some human powers which were quite different to matter as we had already understood it. The ground was cut from under the feet of my, uh, under the feet of the materialist, and my old position had been destroyed. Um, so he got very interested in um, going to seances and that kind of thing. He accused the scientific establishment of being unscientific and dogmatic. People like um, Charles Darwin. Thomas Henry, uh, Henry Huxley, Tyndall and Spencer, and so forth, um, because they refused to entertain the possibility, which he saw himself as being more scientific because he, he remained open-minded to these possibilities. Um, it has to be said, you know, Conan Doyle was very much um, in a minority. I mean, he wasn't alone. There were other scientists, um, I think I mentioned before, William Crookes um, um, uh, and others, who, um, who were also similarly interested in, and indeed in some cases um, persuaded uh, of the legitimacy of spiritualism, but they were largely a minority, and certainly in the context of this sort of ideological settlement, as Luckhurst calls it, they were, as uh, Diana Barsham says, at, at odds with the rationality paradigm of post-enlightenment masculinity. So there's something about Doyle's masculinity, which, it, and this is one of the things so interesting about um, Doyle, given that his stories are so immersed in ideas about adventure and, and all the kind of you know, fairly familiar motifs of, of the Romance Revival, that he should stand at such odds with the dominant kind of rational paradigm of masculinity in this period. Um, now, there's some in interesting um, anecdotes. So I, I, well, what I think I'll do is um, put these slides up on Unilearn rather than reading through everything. I'll just maybe sort of summarise this one, um, bearing in mind the time that's available. Um, in 1894... Conan Doyle went along with um, Frank Podmore and Sidney Scott, who were two of the uh, preeminent investigators uh, of the Society for Psychical Research, to investi investigate a poltergeist case in Dorset. Um, and it was uh, a poltergeist that had been reported at the house of um, a, a retired colonel who'd been um, involved in the Afghan campaign. Um, and when they went to visit the house, they, uh, they, they sort of set up various sort of things to, to try to sort of, you know, see whether it was a trick. They put strings across hallways and things like that to see whether somebody was sneaking around. And it was basically inconclusive. They'd heard nothing the first night. The second night, they heard some banging noises. And Conan Doyle um, said that um, 
that the other investigators had sort of been prejudiced against in the first place. Um, but they concluded that it was uh, a member of the family who was, um, who was kind of playing a trick. Years later, Conan Doyle says, he met somebody who knew the family and they told him that um, sometime after their visit to um, this, uh, this house, the bones of a child had been dug up in the garden. And he speculates that haunted houses are rare and houses with buried human beings in their gardens are also, we hope, rare. Um, he suggests that these bones um, are, indicate perhaps some kind of speculation that um, if a life cut short, suddenly and violently short, um, has some store of unspent vitality which could still manifest itself in a strange, mischievous fashion. So a bit like, you know, um, houses built on um, Native American burial grounds and all that sort of kind of, you know, stock um, things of, uh, of kind of horror movies of the 20th century. Conan Doyle speculates that there is some sort of relationship between the human remains and this kind of um, poltergeist activity afterwards. The point is, he's, he's sort of, you know, he wants to believe this sort of stuff. Um, Jerome K. Jerome tells a different story whereby Conan Doyle himself found the daughter of, um, uh, of the, uh, the, the house um, actually making the noises herself and uh, promised not to reveal her secret if she stopped doing it. And there's, his biographers point to, throughout the 1890s, this sort of what they call flashes of belief and blackouts of disbelief um, in the idea of psychical research and spiritualism and so forth. I mean, he, he's interested in psychical research from the um, mid-1880s. He doesn't actually convert to spiritualism um, until the First World War. So he spends 30 years or so trying to make his mind up how he feels about this stuff. And I think that's quite an interesting way of, uh, of thinking through the, uh, the stories that we're looking at, the novels that he writes, as attempts to grapple with these contradictions and, and the, uh, the ways in which he believes and doesn't believe by terms. The Brown Hand, to return to that story, clearly draws upon these experiences at this house in Dorset. Um, Hardacre, the narrator, describes how, as a member of the Soci Psychical Research Society, I had formed one of a committee of three who spent the night in a haunted house our adventures were neither exciting nor convincing, but such as it was, the story appeared to interest my auditors in a remarkable degree. Um, there are also um, resonances with uh, the characters in the story. So Dominic Holden also um, who uh, returns from uh, colonial service, uh, not Afghanistan but India, but of course the, the man whose hand he um, severs was uh, describing the story as, as being from Afghanistan. And he returns with a number of features which might be seen to mark him as in some way uh, with, with um, the mark of, of colonial otherness. Um, he returns a broken man with the framework of a giant that had fallen away. There's that sort of sense of degeneration about him, of a, of a kind of falling away of his, his capacities. He's described as having a red Indian nose and cheek. Um, and then Hardacre comments on curious, pungent delicacy served by a stealthy, quick-eyed oriental waiter um, and has a collection of bloated organs, gaping cysts, distorted bones, odious parasites, a singular exhibition of the products of India. So, in line with um, the comments that um, many of you made about the story and its overt sort of racist tendencies, there is this very sort of strongly negatively marked representation of uh, the Orient uh, that's uh, in evidence in the story. The ghost is of an Afghan peasant from some mountain tribe living away at the back of beyond somewhere on the other side of Kafiristan. Clearly marked then as, uh, as backward, regressive, back of beyond. Um, and having these religious beliefs, which the story goes to some lengths to try to um, uh, distance itself from, to, to mark as being primitive in some way, um, describing the man's belief as being essentially the same as the analogous superstition that led to the ancient Egyptian practice of mummification. And this religious, religious belief that the body should be reunited after death. Um, so to make a perfect dwelling for the spirit. So this kind of importance is placed on the body as an object. So things are really important in these stories. They're, they're, things are important on, as, as basis for scientific evidence, for empirical measurement, but they're also important because they seem to have this kind of symbolic investment in them as well. And the idea of a thing, what, what we mean by a thing, is something which has um, sort of attracted the attention of uh, critics and uh, critical theorists um, in, in recent years, um, partic I mean, particularly stories like Conan Doors, which, which do seem to foreground things so much, and they seem to have these kind of uncanny functions within the stories. 
And in a very influential essay by uh, Bill Brown called Thing Theory, um, Brown states that um, the thing really names, names less an object than a particular subject-object relation. In other words, the importance of things in these stories is not what the actual thing is in itself, but in what that thing communicates about the relationship between uh, subjects and objects. So uh, subjects, people, and objects, or people as objects. And the way that people are rendered as objects or transformed into objects, the brown hand being the most overt and offensive of those examples, but not the only one by any means. Um, so if you think about some of the, uh, the, the features that run through these stories, um, there's a strong emphasis on comparative anatomy, for example, you know, taking <coughs> bones from different people and looking at their relationship with them and seeing them as you know, marking patterns of evolution or something like that. Um, the idea of the animistic fetish, the mummy, will be one example of that, a sort of a, a dead object that can be returned to life that has some sort of magical powers. Um, abjected bodies, bodies that are sort of disgusting in some way or, or, or represented as kind of freakish objects, you know, in this collection of bloated organs that Sir Dominic has as his sort of pride and joy. Bodies which become racial signifiers. Um, the spirit conceived of as a thing that makes noises that can touch and shake you awake. Um, or bones buried in gardens that testify to unspent vitality. There's, there's a lot of this kind of uh, representation of things as, as embodying some sort of subject-object relation. And those relationships, I, I, I guess, we might think about in, in, in these sorts of terms, that one of the ways, or one of the subject-object relations that these things seem to mediate is the relationship between colonizer and colonized. You know, the colonizer collects body parts, the colonized are the, the things which are collected. Um, but also between present and past, because these objects are also, as, as well as being marked as being sort of um, culturally other uh, in that sort of colonial relationship, but they're also marked as being either belonging to the ancient past or in some way uh, being marked as a kind of a survival of the, the ancient past or the primitive within the present. They are also, um, the subject-object relation is also marked in terms of the contrast between science on the one hand and superstition on the other. This sound recording is going to be great, isn't it? Um, and um, empiricism on the one hand and fetishism on the other. So empiricism being a kind of a validated way of thinking about objects. Fetishism as being a sort of a, a way of thinking about objects which is to be disavowed. Um, and I think in Conan Doyle's stories, these things are kind of run together in, in interesting sorts of ways. Now, um, whilst I was um, reading these stories and thinking about them as part of a research project, um, I got interested in the fact that in the Brown Hand in particular, the description of the, the place is, is incredibly vivid and incredibly detailed. Um, and one of the joys of... Um, living in a kind of world of, of digitised archives is the fact that if you want to see what Wiltshire was like in the late 19th century, you can just kind of mooch around until you find a map that shows what it was like in the late 19th century. And I wanted to see, you know, what happens if you actually follow the journey that Hardacre takes um, in this story? You know, what, why is it positioned so precisely in the landscape? Um, so he arrives at a place um, in Wiltshire called Dinton, um, and it describes him taking the route from uh, Dinton Station to the point where the arable land of the plains begins to swell upwards into the rounded chalk hills, which are characteristic of the country. So that's Dinton circled at the top there of the railway station there. And the, the, the point about, I want to sort of make about this, I should say, is that there's a, there's a mapping of, of the English landscape that takes place in this story that is really about mapping the present onto the past. And it's remarkably similar to the way that Conan Doyle maps the, present, uh, onto the colonial present onto the ancient Egyptian past in another story that I want to relate these things to together. Essentially, I think he's describing the same kind of journey from the present into the past, overlaying the ancient landscape on the, on the modern one. So he describes a, a road that winds through the valleys, um, formed by a succession of grassy hills, the summit of each of which was carved into the most elaborate fortifications – 
some circular and some square, but all on a scale which has defied the winds and the rains of many centuries. So these are the, the hill forts in Wiltshire. These are the, the, the hills that it's travelling towards. Conan Doyle stayed um, in a cottage uh, about half a mile away from Dinton Station. Um, and um, he's clearly describing a landscape which he, which he knew. Um, some call them Roman and some British, but their true origin and the reasons for this particular tract of country being so interlaced with entrenchments has never been finally made clear. The ancient world, the, the ancient English landscape, in other words, is this kind of mystery. It's also a mystery to do with the relationships between the, the landscape of the, the colonised and the landscape of the colonised, in this case, not the, the British colonising Egypt, um, but the Romans colonising Britain. And he describes, as he moves further through it, these uh, landscapes of barrows of tumuli, the cremated ashes of the race, graves that tell us nothing save that a jar full of dust represents the man who once laboured under the sun. So it's this kind of funereal landscape as well. It's a landscape of war, of conflict between colonised and colonisers, and this kind of mysterious funereal landscape that he makes his way through. And it leads down, supposedly, to the, 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 uh, the big country house where... Um, Hardacre's uncle, Sir Dominic Holden, uh, lives in a big family mansion. Which is actually, if you follow the journey that he describes, takes you to a place called Cranbourne Chase. And that's interesting, to me at least, um, because Cranbourne Chase was the site of the, by far the, the most significant archaeological excavations um, of Britain of the late 19th century by a man called General Pitt Rivers. If anybody ever visited the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, you will be aware of just what a kind of weird um, collection that is. Um, but these, the, the excavations that Pitt Rivers was undertaking at the time that Conan Doyle visited the area were he was excavating earthworks that were to be there in, in description contemporaneous with it, which were erected by superior people against inferior people and a lower condition of life. In other words, it's a landscape that's the Wiltshire landscape and, the, and what Conan Doyle would have encountered um, in relation to these excavations at Cranbourne Chase is a, an account of Britain and the, the ancient Britons which describes empirically measuring skulls and thigh bones and so forth to determine who were in these graves, this superior and this inferior race that, um, that he's describing back in the ancient British past and these earthworks that were built to defend one from the other. The Pitt Rivers Museum... Um, I, I would uh, strongly recommend a visit, but one of the things that it explicitly aims to do is to map the ancient world against the modern colonial world. So there are, it's, the idea of the collection is that artefacts are arranged in concentric rings going outwards from the, the, the most modern to the most ancient. And in the most ancient ones, you'll have artefacts that are excavated from these barrows in Wiltshire placed alongside contemporary artefacts from other cultures. The idea to illustrate that they are at the same stage of civilization. That, um, that people in these other cultures were at thousands of years ago. Now, in another of his um, stories, uh, The Tragedy of the Coruscope, published in 1897, so um, not uh, just a, a year or two before he wrote the, the Brown Hand story, Conan Doyle describes um, a journey up the Nile. Um, and it's a journey which results in the people on this uh, Thomas Cook's boat being kidnapped um, and by, by Mardist forces and, and, and uh, taken into the desert. One of the things that's quite interesting, I think, about this is that he dis the description he gives of the Nile Valley is very, very similar to the description he gives of Wiltshire in many respects. He talks about traces of vanished races and submerged civilizations, grotesque graves, that funereal landscape again, uh, uh, dot the hills or stand up against the skyline, pyramidal graves, tum tumulus graves, rock graves everywhere, graves. Sometimes you learn that it's been Roman, sometimes Egyptian, sometimes all record of its name or origin has been absolutely lost. Again, that sort of idea about the kind of mysteriousness of the ancient colonial uh, imperial past. And you ask yourself, why any race should build in so uncouth a solitude? Um, and what's the, the, what's the role of these many fortresses to hold off the wild and predatory men of the south? So again, that idea of conflict between uh, different cultures, um, the, the kind of... The, the colonising and the colonised. Um, you, won't, you won't be able to make this out terribly well. It's a, it's a, we should, this is a, a map. Sorry. 
This is a map of um, the, the Nile and the, the journeys that Cooks ran up, up and down the Nile at the time. There's a, a fascinating kind of relationship between um, Thomas Cooks and the development of tourism in Egypt and also the uh, facilitation of imperialism. And basically, the army paid Cooks to transport um, weapons and troops up the Nile, and that rendered it financially viable to uh, run tourists up and down the Nile such as Conan Doyle when he visited, and also the, um, the characters within this story. Um, I'm going to skip over a little bit of this, other than to um, say that at, during the time that Conan Doyle visited Egypt, he was travelling up and down the Nile, um, the British decided to embark upon a campaign to um, reclaim um, the Sudan from Mahdist forces which, after it had overrun um, killed General Gordon in Khartoum. There was a sort of a big imperial push to, to uh, retake um, Sudan. And Conan Doyle offered himself as a war correspondent, went and had dinner with General Kitchener, um, and generally speaking was very excited by the whole thing. But when it looked like it was going to be delayed, uh, possibly for up to a year before any action took place, he decided to come home and was invited by one of the other war correspondents he met to observe military manoeuvres on Salisbury Plain um, in Wiltshire. And uh, that's when he stayed in the cottage um, in a, a place that's just about half a mile from Dinton Station. So, in other words, the circumstances that, that um, Conan Doyle went through in writing the tragedy of the Corosco, thinking about that landscape, thinking about the relationship between not just the uh, archaeological evidence of conflicts between you know, a, a colonial, more advanced colonial power and the primitive men of the South, as he calls them, but also of the British Empire, and it's situated in this relationship um, of, of conflict in the uh, Egypt and Sudan at the time. Um, Conan Doyle seeks to distance himself, however, from the ideas of um, the ancient Egyptian spirituality, in particular the idea of mummification and the afterlife as it relates to the body. Um, and I've already talked about that to some extent with the brown hand, so, and I'm conscious of time, so I will not dwell on that any further than, other than to say just how dismissive of this he is. Um, what it, he says, what a degraded intelligence does it not show the idea that the body, the old outworn greatcoat, which was once wrapped around the soul, should at any cost be preserved, is the last word in materialism. So, in... The brown hands in that particular story, there are a number of things which I think we can see converging in, in terms of the influences upon it. Um, you've got, on the one hand, Conan Doyle's experiences in um, Colonel Elmore's house and the scientific polemic against spiritualism, the desire to kind of refute that and find some empirical evidence, some objects uh, or measurable thing that, that refutes that scientific evidence. So still speaking within scientific terms, but finding something that validates other ideas. You've got the Nile tourism and ancient Egyptian religion, the imperial war in Egypt, um, and also this kind of military archaeological tourism in Wiltshire. The whole thing becomes sort of stitched together um, in the story of the Brown Hand. Now, just to, to bring things um, towards um, some sort of conclusion that points us beyond the stories we were looking at last week and, and towards thinking about the Hand of the Baskervilles, there are... I suppose what I'm, what I'm sort of been trying to describe and get a sense of is how Conan Doyle's stories from the, the uh, beginnings of uh, Sherlock Holmes and working through to the hand of the Baskervilles can be seen to be working through and working over a number of issues that sort of weave in and out with each other um, that aren't simply dominated by one single idea. So I don't think it's just about spiritualism. I don't think it's just about colonialism. I think one of the things that's interesting about Conan Doyle is the way that those ideas shift around depending on what point he's trying to prove. Sometimes the, uh, the idea of sort of proving some sort of colonial superiority plays second fiddle to the idea of, of demonstrating the validity of a, a particular kind of spiritual belief. And that, I, that sense in which he kind of oscillates between belief and disbelief, I think, you know, possibly is one of the things that feeds into that. But to try to make sense of the hand of the basketballs and some of the motifs within that story, I think it helps to try to sort of think them through in terms of where Conan Doyle's uh, ideas and writing has been developing over the previous 10 years. And a number of the motifs that we find in the Hands of the Baskerville, it seems to me, can be related to these stories that he was writing in the 1890s. 
um, the, the prehistoric landscape of Dartmoor, which is you know, a, a hugely kind of atmospheric brooding presence throughout the novel, um, and those primitive dwellings that are uh, situated on, on Dartmoor, resonate very strongly, I think, not only with um, that, that Wiltshire landscape in the brown hand, but also with the ancient Egyptian landscape as well. Selden, as a figure who is a, a criminal and a murderer, but also uh, somebody who is um, clearly described as, as a degenerate, as some sort of uh, anthropological throwback, who's out on the moor um, occupying the primitive dwellings as well in suggested kinds of ways. Sherlock Holmes, who reads um, Mortimer's stick like some kind of an anthropological or archaeological artefact, but who was himself also... Um, an object of fascination for Mortimer, who you know, kind of covets his skull, he wants to keep his skull uh, in, a, in a collection. And Dr. Mortimer himself, who we're told near the start of the novel, um, has written celebrated essays on anthropology and theories about degeneration. Do we progress? That kind of thing. The tension within the novel between empirical explanations and ideas, sort of fetishistic ones, between the idea that what you've got on the, the moor is a, is a dog painted with phosphorus, and then the other, that this sort of spectral ancestral curse that sort of roams the moors. In the relationship between Sir Hugo Baskerville and Stapleton, we've also got some sort of idea about atavism and sort of generational throwback as well, and the idea of a kind of primitive return there as well. And it seems to me not entirely coincidental and possibly um, a, a deliberate kind of... Um, sort of barbed characteristic, that it's Stapleton, the naturalist, the scientist, who is who's marked here by this kind of atavistic primitivism. Okay, so, um, you won't, of course, be able to read the bibliography from there, but I'll put these slides up on, um, onto UniLearn, and however the screencast works out, no doubt with lots of bangs and clatters throughout it, I will try and put that up as well. Thank you.